from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. I'm Stephanie Marcus from the Science, Technology, and Business Division here at the library. Um, back in the fall of 2015, when we were looking at topics that the, a woman from NASA who we work with in outreach gave us, we saw a long list of things, and there were so many great topics that we did choose eight instead of the normal six. But among them was gravitational waves, and we were going, what's that? Nobody seemed to know, and at that time, none had been detected, although they had been trying to detect them for at least 15 years, or... 40 years? Well, 100 years. Uh, Einstein was the one who theorized that these things existed, and sometimes he was poo-pooed, and sometimes he was believed, and finally, um, in February of this year, they had the first detection in two of their, their sites in Washington State and in Louisiana. And it was just a chirp from <laughs> the collision of two black holes. So this was really phenomenal, and everybody was so excited. And we were excited that that was a topic we had chosen, and we were looking so savvy. We always like to be with it. And people were calling us and saying, are you going to have a lecture on gravitational waves? And we said, yes, we are. It was originally planned for November, but there is a new child coming into the world in Dr. Thorpe's family on that very day, maybe. <laughs> and so we moved it up to August, and we're glad because we really wanted to get into this topic while it was hot, and it will be hot for a long time. Hot for the next century. So a little bit about Dr. Thorpe before we start. He's an astrophysicist in the Gravitational Astrophysics Laboratory at NASA Goddard. He earned degrees in mechanical engineering and physics at Bucknell and an MS in physics from the University of Maryland College Park. So he's been local, and at, after that he uh, got his PhD. Um, where was the PhD? Florida, the University of Florida. Gators. So he's also a, a graduate Gator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he did a postdoc at NASA before he began his employment there in 2009. Uh, he's received both individual and team awards at Goddard for his work on gravitational waves. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Thorpe to the Library of Congress. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie, for the warm introduction. Thanks for everyone for coming, and thank you uh, very much for the library for uh, inviting me to come out and have this opportunity to talk to everybody, and I'm, I'm ecstatic we got a packed house. So let's just get right to it. So, um, so I figured that since I was coming to the Library of Congress, I should do something related with documents. Right now, I'm not a historian. I'm a scientist. There are a lot of uh, science historians that do this stuff for a living. So I'm going to, you know, basically, uh, you know, take this with a grain of salt. But these these are ten papers that I picked uh, that I think are sort of relevant for telling the story of gravitational waves. And so they go all the way from not surprisingly Einstein in 1915, 100 years ago to uh, two papers from this year um, in 2016. You notice these guys both start with the letter A, and that's because this is like 1,000 people, and this is a, a, um, you know, about 100 people. So that shows you also a difference in, in how science has been done in the last, last 100 years, the era of, of large collaborations. So starting right away with Einstein, um, so this is a paper from 1915. I don't speak German, but this basically says uh, you know, on the theory of relativity or general rel relativity. And general relativity, so people associate Einstein with this idea of relativity, and some people don't realize that there's, there's actually two theories of relativity. And the special relativity one is the one that happened first, and it's the one that told us about this idea that there's uh, nothing that can go faster than the speed of light. Um, and that's one of the sort of postulates of, of the theory of special relativity. And that was a very successful, successful theory, and, 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 and it made you know, Einstein famous in sort of scientific circles, but he wasn't really famous uh, in the general public circles at, at that time. Um, but one of the things that was pretty quickly realized is that Newton's theory of gravity, which again was very successful because we could use it to predict the motion of the planets, um, didn't, mer didn't match with special relativity. And, and in particular, if you had a, a, an object, you know, there's some piece of mass, and you moved it, the information that that had moved, you know, in terms of the gravitational information, in Newton's theory, propagated instantly. So a way to think about it is that if you were to take the sun and just, you know, suddenly make it disappear, 
the Earth would instantaneously know that it wasn't being, getting that gravitational field. And that's a way that, it's, that, that sort of information would be propagating faster than the speed of light. And Einstein said, gosh, that, that just can't work. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't uh, jive with spe special relativity. And this is sort of showing you the, the, the genius that it's Einstein. You know, he doesn't say, well, maybe my theory is wrong and Newton's right. He goes, well, maybe our whole idea of gravity is wrong. Right? And it takes him years and years and years to, to finally figure out and come up with this theory of, of general relativity, which I'll, I'll try to explain a, a little bit in the following way. So we know general relativity is about gravity. And if you usually ask people, you say, well, how do we know about gravity? And you say, well, sh that's easy. I just drop something, and there you go, gravity, right? Um, however, you know, you can imagine if you had a skydiver, and I'm being, this is a physicist skydiver, so it's perfectly frictionless, which is not good for, <laughs> not, not, not good for skydiving, but good for this illustration. If the skydiver releases the ball, nothing happens. It just sits there, right? Because they're both accelerating at the same rate. And so, you know, I think everyone would agree that, that somehow gravity is involved in that problem, but, but um, you know, somehow it doesn't seem to be apparent to the skydiver when, when, when he's measuring this, right? And so to make a long story short, uh, one of the things that turns out to really understand the difference between just the effects of acceleration, that is doing your measurement in, a, in an accelerating uh, laboratory, versus gravitation, you need to make a measurement that's not local. That is, you need to compare measurements that happen at different places. And this is an illustration of that. So if you have two balls um, that are way up high and you drop them, you notice that they actually don't drop in exactly parallel lines. They actually start to get closer to one another, and that's because they're each traveling towards the center of the Earth, not directly down. So down is a different direction when you're over here and when you're over here, right? And it's only, so an accelerating frame wouldn't give you that effect, but gravitation does give you that effect. And that's a way to sort of unequivocally de determine the difference between the fact that you're just doing a measurement in an accelerating laboratory or you're doing a measurement where there's gravitation. So this is, this is a really um, fundamental idea for any kind of gravitational measurement. You need to make a measurement over a long distance. And when you get to gravitational wave detectors, which we'll eventually get to in this talk, you'll see that uh, having a separated distance is really, really important. Okay? And the mathematical name for this thing is called geodesic deviation. And it's a, this idea that trajectories that are in free fall are not um, parallel. That is, they, they can converge or diverge. So you also hear this idea of curved space time. So where does this come from? Well, this comes from this idea that geometry is, and the geometry of curvature is a nice way to describe. It's a, it's a perfect example of places where you have uh, straight lines that converge. So you imagine if you have a person over here on the equator and a person over here on the equator, and they both say they're going to go north, right, which, which on a map projection would look like it was a straight line, they actually come together and, in fact, they meet at the North Pole, right? So that's an example of lines that are straight, that is, you know, straight lines on the surface of a sphere that converge, right? And the reason they converge is because the surface that they're on is curved, right? So people can kind of picture that in the head. There's a lot of math behind it, but that's the basic idea, right, is that, that this geometry, this idea of curvature, can be used to describe how things that are straight lines, just like those freely falling uh, balls that we had in the last thing, can converge or diverge. And it has to do with the underlying curvature of the, of the system that they're on. So Einstein basically extends that whole idea to space and time. And so it's really difficult to visualize because it's, it's curvature in four dimensions. And so, you know, it's almost it's effectively impossible to, to, to visualize other than, let's say, we imagine we sort of suppress one of the other dimensions and measure that curvature in, 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 in that, that some sort of extra dimension. So here you have this idea that space time is a sort of rubber sheet. You put something massive like the Earth on it. The Earth deforms that rubber sheet. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting about it is that if you have, you know, any kind of object, you know, a ball or even a particle of light, uh, it's going to follow one of these straight lines, but these straight lines now have curvature to them that are produced by that mass, by, you know, produced by the mass of the Earth. And so the way we like to say how general relativity works is that matter sp tells space-time how to curve. So depending upon the distribution of matter in the universe, you get a distribution of curvature. And curvature, that is space-time, tells matter how to move. Right? So if things are in, in uh, free-fall orbits, their free-fall orbits are going to be affected by the background curvature of space-time. In equation form, this is Einstein's equations. So somebody asked me if I was going to show Einstein's equations. There you go. Doesn't look so hard, right? So this is a, an object called the Einstein curvature tensor. So this is a mathematical description of uh, you know, space time. You can write down a curvature tensor for a ball. You can write it down for, for, for all kinds of things. Um, and then this is just some constants. And then this other bit here is called the stress energy tensor. It's basically just a way to describe how uh, matter is distributed in the universe.
So that's really it. That's Einstein's equations. Now the hard part is that this is a set of coupled nonlinear differential equations, and there are very few um, solutions for, to, the, to these equations in terms of closed close form solutions. So you kind of have a, this very beautiful theory, but it's but there's there's very few beautiful solutions. Um, if, if that's a one, one way to think about it. So, you know, this would just be some sort of esoteric, interesting thing for, for mathematicians if it wasn't for the fact that it actually works. And so Einstein himself in 1916, so a year after their first publication, um, uh, uh, sort of suggested three tests. These are known as the three classical tests of general relativity. And the first one Einstein basically did himself in that, that same paper. And this is because the planet Mercury had been known to have an orbit that wasn't closed. And so, you know, all of our planets are in a slightly elliptical orbit. And what you could watch is that, that the, the axis of that ellipse actually processes around the sun at a very, very slow rate, 40 seconds of arc per century. So a second of arc, so you have 360 degrees in a circle, you have 60 minutes in each degree, and 60 seconds in each, in each minute, right? So it's a 3600th of a degree, and there's 40 of those per century. Now, that's an incredibly tiny amount, but astronomers in the 19th century were already able to notice this, right? So maybe they measured it as 38 instead of 40, but they were already able to measure this. And Einstein found that the GR immediately just predicted this and explained why, if you do the body problem in GR, that you actually get this, this precession. And it shows it most in Mercury because Mercury gets closest to the sun, and so the, the GR effects are biggest when you, when you get nearby. The other one, um, and again, this, is, this, this made him like, pretty famous, right? But the one that really kicked him off was this idea of this deflection of light by massive bodies. And so 1916, he, 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 uh, he predicts this. Turns out that there's a major solar eclipse uh, in 1919. Uh, we have another one coming up next year. This shows you sort of how, kind of how rare these things are. And this guy, Arthur Eddington, observed this. Here's a Washington Times. You know, are the stars really where we see them? And basically, they could see this deflection of the starlight exactly as Einstein predicted. Actually, it was interesting. It took a couple years because he actually had a factor two mistake in his prediction, which he was able to correct between his prediction and the actual opportunity to observe the, observe the eclipse. And this is what really makes Einstein famous, right? The third test that he, that he proposed is this thing called gravitational redshift, which is this idea that if you send some light out of a gravitational field, it'll change its color due to the fact that it has to lose energy when it's leaving the gravitational field. It took, whoops, it took till 1959 before Pound and Rebka were actually able to make that measurement. So this is starting to get you a, uh, an idea of how, long, how far ahead the theory was of the technology. Right? And that's a, that's a theme for the rest of this. So I mentioned that um, in Einstein's equations, there's very few closed form solutions. But there's one solution which Einstein himself recognized, which is a wave solution. So this is what we call gravitational waves. Um, and so here's, an, again, another paper from Einstein, again, a single author paper. And he finds out that, that these waves, um, so basically mathematically, the, solu the, the equations will admit a wave solution. That solves the equations, right? And so he says, well, gosh, what's the speed of these waves? And when he works it out, he goes, it's the speed of light. He goes, well, that's kind of interesting. Maybe that's the way that gravity can be compatible with special relativity, right? It's a way that gravitational information can be propagated across the universe is in gravitational waves. And, you know, there was a lot of debate here because this sort of shows you how difficult the, the, the math is. Einstein and others, and actually Einstein himself, went back and forth about, you know, is this real? Is this a mathematical artifact? Is it real? And Eddington, the very same guy that had made that, um, made that eclipse measurement, uh, sort of quipped that gravitational waves propagate at the speed of thought. So basically the idea that they're not real, right? They're just this sort of figment of, figment of the imagination. And this, was, this debate, you know, again, is, is confined to this really sort of uh, small circle of theoretical physicists that are working on relativity, a, a very new science. So what would they look like? Well, they would be transverse to, to the propagation. So basically the waves stretch and squeeze space and time, and they stretch and squeeze them in a direction that's orthogonal to the way the wave is, the wave is propagating. So imagine a wave is going into our screen here, and you see that they stretch and they squeeze. Um, and they're actually area preserving, which is kind of interesting. So they stretch on one axis at the same time that they're squeezing on the other one, and then they do the opposite. They're, they travel at the speed of light, as I mentioned, and they have two polarizations. We call this one plus because it has axes that are sort of plus, and then this one is at 45 degrees. We call this a cross polarization. Okay, so this is what Einstein's theory sort of said. But again, we didn't really know, is this, is this, a, is this something real? So um, a little bit later, all, all back in, in, up in 1959, um, there was, after a lot of discussion, included a famous physicist Richard Feynman. Uh, these guys, Bondi, Pirani, and Robinson, uh, published this paper 
that really showed that you could extract energy from these gravitational waves, and therefore they must be real, right? And this is basically the, the argument that they had. So their argument was, imagine you had a rod, and on that rod you had some beads, and those beads were a little sticky. You know, they basically were able to slide on the rod, but they rubbed a little bit. And they showed that if you have a gravitational wave come by, it makes these beads go back and forth. Those beads rub on the rod, it heats up the rod, and the rod's warmed up, right? And so the fact that energy is shown up in that rod shows you that that energy came from these gravitational waves. It's one of these beautiful uh, thought experiments uh, that, that sort of shows. Now, trying to actually build something like that took, you know, another 40 years, right? But, but basically, um, that's the fundamental idea that says, you know what? It might actually be possible to detect these things, okay? So, so that was a, a very important, uh, important breakthrough as well. And at the same time, people were starting, trying to understand, well, okay, where in nature might we actually find gravitational waves? So, um, again, there was this, uh, there was this idea that well, um, general relativity was sort of interesting for these very small effects of things like perihelion shift of Mercury and deflecting light by the sun, but it wasn't really important for astrophysics. Um, well, these guys, Peters and Matthews, in, in 63, uh, were able to sort of do, do an approximate solution of Einstein's equations, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, but what they basically showed is for a binary system, and binary star systems of various kinds are one of the most common types of star systems that we have in the universe. Most stars are, are in binaries. And um, they showed that they'll actually lose energy because they'll, they'll radiate gravitational waves, and that'll affect the orbit of the binary. And they made a quantitative prediction for how fast, fast that energy would change, and basically how strong the gravitational waves would be. So here's a basic idea. So I've got two stars, or two black holes, or two neutron stars, or a planet and a star, you know, wh whatever you like. Uh, they're orbiting around one another, and if you work out Einstein's equations, as Peters and Matthews did, uh, you find out that, they, that those stars as they orbit will release energy and momentum in the form of gravitational waves. Now that energy has to come from somewhere, and where it comes from is in the orbit of the, of, of, of the two objects. So basically they fall closer to one another. So if you look at Newtonian mechanics, when they fall closer to one another, they have to speed up. Right? So they, they speed up, and now they're closer to one another, they're moving faster, and so the amount of energy they, they release is even greater. And so you can very quickly see that this is a runaway process. You basically you know, lose a little bit of energy, you get closer, you lose more energy, you get closer, you lose more energy, you get closer, and it gets up, 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 until eventually these things crash into one another. Now, Peters and Matthews um, could sort of predict uh, by extrapolating where they would, would crash into one another, but the math that they used to do this extrapolation didn't work once you got the things really close to one another, right? Basically, all these approximations that they had to use uh, break down when they try to get the stars almost touching, right? And so, at least for this part of it, it's interesting. For this part, you're going to need something new, and I'll talk about that um, in, in a little bit. So then, this is what really kicked off the field, and this is a gentleman that was working up at the University of Maryland, uh, a very accomplished experimental physicist named Joseph Weber, and he starts basically based on these ideas from, from Bondi and others uh, to build gravitational wave antennas, and he calls them these, these, these bar detectors. And lo and behold, he actually claims to see an event, and this just sets off uh, the, the whole physics community. So here's basically how Weber's system you used. So he wasn't looking so much for a binary star system, but he was looking for uh, pulsars, which had been recently discovered. So pulsars are rapidly spinning uh, neutron star. And the idea is that the pulsar has a little bump on it. If it's anything other than a perfect sphere, it's also going to radiate gravitational waves, because basically that bump is going to go whipping around the top of the pulsar, and you're going to get gravitational waves coming out. So that's the idea here. And, and his detector is very simple. You basically take a bar of material, and you want to have a material that's got a, a high mechanical quality, so something like a metal or a crystal. Um, you want it to be big so that it can couple to the, these waves, and you want it to sort of be isolated, so suspended, so that it's sort of free to ring like a bell. And if these waves come by and they happen to have the frequency that matches the natural resonance frequencies of the bar, the bar is going to ring. And then you just have to measure the bar ringing. Now, Weber was a, a, a very smart experimental physicist, and he knew that there could be other things that might cause the bar to ring. And so he said, aha, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build two bars, and I'm going to spread them apart. I'm going to put one at University of Maryland, and I'm going to put one at Argonne Lab in Chicago. And if they're spread that far apart, it's unlikely that there's any kind of effect that can make both of them go blip at the same time. And when he sees both of them go blip at the same time, this is from his paper, he says, gravitational wave, right? So, so this got people going, uh, uh, you know, really excited in the, in the field. Um, so it generates this tremendous interest. So the astrophysicists all sort of jump out and say, wait, you know, how big could a mountain be on a pulsar? And how many of them should there be out there? And, and, and that kind of thing. 
an experimenter say, well, I'm going to build a bar too. And they, there's, there's like a dozen of these major efforts that are built all over the world and nobody finds anything. So first of all, the astronomers say, you know, the rates are just not really compatible with what you're seeing. You shouldn't have seen, because he, he claims two or three possible detections. And they say, you know, you just shouldn't see that many. And the other people building the detectories, even though they're actually even starting to make little improvements, they don't see anything. And so eventually people sort of start to decide that, that, that Weber must be wrong, uh, despite the fact that you know, to his death, he believed that he had detected the, the gravitational waves. So it's kind of a, a mixed legacy here. So on the one hand, if it weren't for Weber, we never would have gotten all of the interest from the astrophysicists and the, and the experimental physics community. And on the other hand, we sort of got this stigma of, of boy, we, we're going to need to have an absolute gold standard event before we ever claim, it, claim a real detection. And so the community sort of really felt the impact of, of, of this gentleman. So shortly after this, um, uh, a gentleman named, uh, by the name of Ray Weiss um, comes up with a different kind of detector based on lasers. Uh, he's working at MIT. Actually, interestingly enough, it came out later that two Soviet scientists had come up with a very similar idea a little bit earlier. Um, and, and actually, this happened. If anyone that's worked in physics has found that during the Cold War, this happened all the time. And, 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 and now there's actually a lot of, of um, you know, former Soviet bloc physicists that are working in U.S. institutions. And whenever you talk to them, they say, you know that the so-and-so knew this before, the, the, you know, <laughs> right? There's, there's always, there's always the, uh, the, the, the Russian guy that knew it before we did. Um, but but in, any, in any case, so Weiss makes some contributions here. He built a prototype. And really what's important, this 1972 paper, which is actually just a publication, an internal MIT publication, he lays out the basic uh, fundamentals for one of these gravitational wave detectors. And this will become the detector that eventually makes the detection in 2015. So here's a, the here's a basic idea, and this is a, a more modern than his, than his uh, concept at the time. But So you have a laser. Uh, this idea is called a, an interferometer, and it dates back to this guy named Michelson, uh, who was working in the 19th century looking at ether drift. And so you, I have this laser, and I have this thing called a beam splitter, which basically divides the light into two paths. And one light goes down this path, one bit of light goes down this path. Um, the purpose of these mirrors, you basically the light bounces back and forth uh, between these, these several, several times or several hundred times, which basically effectively makes the arm lengths much bigger. Um, and in any event, when they come back, if the arms are exactly the same length, then the light comes right back to the laser. If they're off a little bit, then the light, some of the light comes out to the photoreceiver. And you can see from, if you remember that cartoon of how the gravitational wave worked, where it's stretched in one direction and compressed in the other and goes back and forth, that this sort of L-shaped detector where you measure the difference between this arm and this arm is sort of perfect kind of antenna for measuring gravitational wave, because that's exactly what it looks for. It looks for a difference in lengths between these two arms. And so that's the basic idea. So, so what's the problem? So when we work with gravitational waves, um, we work with this thing called strain, all right? So, so strain, if anybody's in engineering, as, as I was um, uh, a while ago, is a mechanical quality called a change in length over length. And the reason we use strain to describe how big our waves are is because it's space itself that's stretching, right? So if I take space, and if I take the, this, this cartoon, you imagine I made it twice as big, well, then the physical motion would be twice as big because there's twice as much space between the cartoon. Everything sort of scales up, right? So, so I want to make my detector, you know, change in length over length is what, what the strain is. And this is a rough estimate um, for how big the strain would be. So you want to have, so, so m is the mass of the objects. Uh, R is sort of how close the objects are to one another. So you want to have a lot of mass in a small space. D is how far away the objects are. So you want them relatively close. And then you have this kind of nasty factor of G squared over C to the fourth. So G is Newton's gravity constant. That's a number that's uh, like 7, 10 to the minus 11 in, in, in standard units. So that's a tiny number, and it's squared. And C is the speed of light. That's 10 to the 8 meters per second. Um, you know, to the fourth power. So that's a big number to the fourth power in the denominator. So this factor is a killer. And so even if you sort of pick the most optimistic astrophysical values for these, you get a number that's like 10 to the minus 21. So that's a sextillionth, a part in a billion trillion. Um, small number. So another way to look at that is that's about the diameter of a hydrogen atom divided by the distance to the sun. Okay? So that's sort of a reasonable size amplitude to expect for a gravitational wave. And that's a point which most people say, that was interesting. I'm going to go back to doing something else. <laughs> um, but people like Weiss, you know, from the 70s, continued to push this. Right? And it eventually became this thing called LIGO. Right? So LIGO, the LIGO project uh, grew out of, of this and many other efforts around. So there are efforts around the world. Um, 
And, and the basically objective is we're going to really try to build something where we think we've got a chance of making a detection. So they built, it was funded by the National Science Foundation primarily. Uh, there's certainly some, some major contributions from international partners. Um, and there's two sites housing four kilometer long L-shaped detectors. So this one is on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in, in Washington State. This one is in Louisiana. Actually, this is very near where all this uh, flooding has gone on recently. Fortunately, the, the detector was designed to handle a thousand year flood and it seems to be okay, although many of the employees are, are, are obviously in, in, in great difficulty right now. Um, but they started it in 1990. A lot of, a lot of pre-project work was going on in the 80s. Uh, it took a while to, to build it. Uh, there's major civil engineering uh, uh, infrastructure here. They did their initial science runs, didn't find anything. Uh, they did an upgrade to advanced LIGO, and in 2015, they turned on advanced LIGO. I think most people know the story there, but if you don't, you'll get it in a few slides. So um, while LIGO was sort of getting going, there was another really important event, and actually this, this could be claimed as sort of the first detection of gravitational waves, although uh, those of us that work in the building the gravitational wave instruments call this an indirect detection. So if you remember Peters and Matthews, this paper from, a, from, from the early 60s, had this idea that um, as you had two stars orbiting one another, they would emit gravitational waves and the orbit would shrink. And what, Peter, what, what Taylor and Weisberg actually did is they had a pulsar system, and it was actually turned out to be a binary pulsar system. I'll explain what that means in a moment. Um, that, that Taylor and one of his graduate students had discovered um, uh, earlier, and they noticed that this thing was actually shrinking, right? And they basically was shrinking at the rate that was predicted by general relativity and due to gravitational waves. So that was that was this really important paper, um, and we'll, we'll show a little bit more of it here. So a pulsar is one of these neutron stars, the same kind of thing Weber was looking for. But in this case, a pulsar has a little radio beam that's, that's uh, pointed in a direction that's not the same as the axis that the star is spinning at. And we actually don't really know why that, the details of why that happens, but these are, are very common astrophysical objects. So if you're a radio astronomer, you just see this blip going by. So if you just look at a patch of the sky, you see blip, 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 right? And actually, when people first discovered these, they thought they were seeing alien civilizations because it was such a regular tick. They said, what could that possibly be? Well, it turns out it's a, it's a, it's a sort of collapsed uh, core of a star with this, with this um, radio beam coming out of it, and it's spinning quite fast. And it's got so much rotational inertia, so much mass, that there's really nothing that can, that can affect its spin very much. And so it's a very good clock. Now, binary pulsars, imagine this thing is pulsing, but it happens to be orbiting another neutron star that's, let's say, not pulsing. And all you can measure are these pulses. But just by timing these pulses, you, if you look over enough, enough time, and you're clever enough, you can actually figure out all the, all the parameters of the orbit. So you can figure out the masses of the stars, you can figure out the separations, you know where they are, et cetera, et cetera. Then you can just plug into Peter and Matthew's formula and you can say, you know, how should the orbit evolve over time? And the answer is that line. And the dots are the measurements. Now, if, you're in, if you ever teach, in, I think someone we had was a high school teacher, right? And so if someone does lab and they, they, they gave you this, you'd say, you cheated. You moved your measurements, right? <laughs> But they didn't, and for this they get the Nobel Prize. Um, the, the interesting thing is that Weisberg, the guy that did a lot of the calculations on that paper, doesn't get the Nobel Prize, but Hulse, the guy that discovered the pulsar, does. So it's just sort of the vagaries of the, uh, of, of, of the um, Nobel Prize system. But anyways, this is, this is sort of, you know, really is the last nail in the coffin of the gravitational wave question, are they real? Because here we're seeing the effect of gravitational waves on a binary star system in nature, right? So, but again, we're not really measuring the waves themselves. We're seeing that the waves are sucking energy out of the system. Okay, so now I'm going to jump up into something a little bit more, more modern. Um, and so that is a paper actually by one of my colleagues, uh, John Baker and Joan Centrella and, and several others at Goddard. There were other groups around the world. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to, again, going back to Peters and Matthews, they had this this equations that worked sort of for the early part of these stars spinning around one another. But these equations broke down when you got really close. And that's because Einstein's equations, there is no closed form solution for two stars orbiting one another. It's called the two body problem. So in Newtonian mechanics, you can work it out. Kepler worked it out. Um, and if you, if you try to do it in Einstein's equations, you, you can do it approximate solutions for certain, for certain situations like widely separated stars. But when you get all the way down to the stars you know, orbiting one another really close, it doesn't work. So the only way you can do this is by a thing called numerical relativity. So you basically chop up Einstein's equations and you solve them in a supercomputer. And, and this is a, a very technical uh, computing challenge. It took about 20 years for people to be able to do this. Um, and this is sort of a, an illustration of two black holes 
their gravitational waves or trajectories. And if you're sitting in the front, you might be able to see some of these grids, which are the, are, are the computational meshes that are being used to uh, compute Einstein's equations on a, on a grid there. So what did they see? So this isn't exactly from their paper, but this is a, this is a, um, a kind of representative thing. This is, the, this is the waveform. And so you see it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. Now this part back here is basically what um, Peters and Matthews were seeing, right? The fact that you have these things oscillating, you get this sort of sinusoidal gravitational wave. And if you look carefully, you see that both the frequency of the wave gets, close, gets, gets higher, which means basically the waves get closer together, right? So you see they're getting scrunched together. And you see that the height of the wave, or the amplitude of the wave, goes up until it reaches this maximum. Now, we call this a chirp because if you were to, to try to make this sound or you play this through, it goes from low frequency, low amplitude to higher frequency amplitude. So it goes whoop, right? And that's exactly what a gravitational wave sounds, sounds like, right? And it was numerical relativity was needed to get this detail, right? So this is what we needed the supercomputer for. This you could do you know, kind of, kind of with that Peters and Matthews formula, this starts to get a little harder. And when you get up to this part, you need to have a, have a supercomputer. Um, and so the other important part about these waveforms is that they can encode astrophysical information. So the precise uh, rate at which this thing rises up tells you something about the mass of the system that's involved. And there's other kinds of information you can figure out from, say, those two different polarizations. This is just plotting one polarization. But if you plot the other polarization, you can figure out the angle of the system and the distance and all kinds of, all kinds of interesting things. So this is really critical for being able to do science with the gravitational waves as opposed to just detecting them. So here's a picture of a chirp. So we're at a library. This is, this is a library at my alma mater at Bucknell University. And you're going to see it get chirped. <laughs> I didn't have time to do one at, at, at the Library of Congress, but um, right. So I did that with with, with my laptop. Um, so so basically, uh, that's you see. You see, I'll play. Maybe see if I can play it again. All right. So what you see is that the the wave is increasing in amplitude and in frequency. So you think it stretched more and more and more and faster and faster and faster, and then it rings down after the merger. So that's that's what a chirp looks like. Now that's a maximum strain of about 10 percent, as opposed to 10 to the minus 21. Right, so that's why if you if you plot it with ten to minus twenty one, it doesn't look like much. Okay, so now we'll get to the the for the rest of the talk here the the main events, uh, which is what happened last year. And actually, it was last September that the detection was was made, and it wasn't until February that it was announced. So advanced LIGO, which is this major upgrade to LIGO. So remember, LIGO was built. They did this several years of science run. They didn't detect anything. So then they went and they did this upgrade. And again, this shows the NSF being you know pretty reasonable about saying we're going to give you yet more funding to do an upgrade when we haven't detected anything. So they do this upgrade and they're just in what they call their final commissioning. They haven't officially started their observing run. So everything's on and basically configured the same way it's going to be during their, during their observing run, but they're not officially started yet. And on September 14th, they get a big signal. And people said, you know, was that an injection? Because occasionally they will put in injections to check that their data pipelines will actually catch it, right? Um, and people said, no, there's, there's no injections on, the, you know, on, on, on that day. Um, and eventually, you know, a bunch of signal analyses, they figure out you know, that this was real. And this is two black holes and two big black holes pretty far away. And what was astounding is this thousand member collaboration was able to keep this thing secret, mostly, for six months. And it was eventually announced on February 11th. And actually, the person that was most responsible for, for, for uh, leaking this was not a member of the collaboration. Um, uh, and, and he didn't really know, but, but uh, people were pretty annoyed with him. I won't name any names. So, uh, you know, this is all stuff from uh, February 12th or February 11th, right? So, so basically the same day. So you get, you know, this nice combination of old media and new media, right? So you got front page above the fold New York Times. Um, this is inside one of the vacuum tubes inside, in, inside LIGO. So the people that do the vacuum engineering were like, aha, it was us that got to be on the New York Times, not you, know, not you silly scientists. Um, and, and here you get uh, Obama tweeting. You know, that, so that's a kind of measure of, of, of uh, success here. You get another new media. This is Mark Zuckerberg here uh, from Facebook, posting on Facebook saying, you know, this is one of the gr greatest discoveries of modern science. Right? Um, and Einstein would be proud. And then finally, this is from the New Yorker, and the birds saying to the other, was that you or two black, black holes crashing into one another? <laughs> right? So this really comes into the public consciousness, which makes 
me doing my job easier. You know, for a while when I would sit on airplanes and people would say, what did you do? You know, you go, oh, I'm going to have to explain all of this. What do I do? And now you just say gravitational waves and bang, they know it, right? So, so this was really great. Although I think the news cycle where we need, we need some more events. Um, so what do they really see? So this is what came out of the Hanford detector. So here's a detector in Washington. So you see, um, this is strain in, in a unit that it doesn't really matter, but it's basically in those 10 to the minus 21 units. Um, so it's bouncing back and forth, and then you see this little wiggle. Now, I think most people would say, really? You know, that's, that's it? That's, that's a wiggle? Well, what really makes this uh, convincing is if you go look at what happened in, 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 in Louisiana. So you have to shift the thing in time a little bit because it actually takes the light and the gravitational waves some time to travel across the country. And look, it's exactly the same, right? And even more interesting is if you match it up with one of those numerical relativity templates, you get the red line is the numerical relativity, and the sort of gray lines are the, um, are the me measured waveform out of the detector. And they, they match quite exactly. And then by matching them, you get to sort of choose things like the mass in order to get the maximum mass, and you actually get to measure the mass. So this is really cool. 36 solar masses, 29 solar masses, add up to being one that's 62 solar masses and at a distance of 410 megaparsecs. So can anybody tell me what's, what looks wrong with this? Any math, math teachers? What's that? Math. Yeah, right. So 36 plus 29 e equals 65, not 62. So okay, there's some error bars. Maybe that's what's going on. That's not what's going on. Three solar masses of energy left the system in gravitational waves in less than a second. Right? So that's so we, we've heard of E equals mc squared. If there's one formula everybody knows, it's E equals mc squared. So take the mass of the sun, multiply by 3, multiply by speed of light squared, you get the amount of energy that left the system. Tremendous amount of energy. In fact, the peak power is about 3 times 10 to 49 watts. That's about 1,000 times brighter than a gamma ray burst, which is generally considered the brightest astrophysical, individual astrophysical event. It's about 10 times brighter than all of the stars in all of the universe, visible universe combined for that second. And yet, it was all coming out in gravitational waves. No light at all. Right? So people sometimes say gravitational waves are weak. They're not weak. They're very strong. They're just hard to detect. Now, that wasn't it for LIGO. So they had their first observing run. So they're doing this sort of series of upgrades to get advanced LIGO up to its full sensitivity. Uh, so this is a, the big one on September 14th. It was a confirmed detection. They had another candidate, which they didn't claim to be a detection, but it's statistically pretty likely to be a detection, something like you know, 95% uh, uh, to be a detection. And then they had another very strong confirmed detection uh, just after Christmas. Uh, they called the Boxing Day event. Uh, shows you the international <laughs> nature of the, uh, of the collaboration. And this is during their, their run that went up until January. So, so um, that's, that's what we've got so far. And another interesting thing, way to look at this is to compare the black holes that LIGO has seen. So these are, the, these are the two merging into the one from the one event. This is the second event, and this is the candidate event. And then this is all the black holes we've known about to date through um, X-ray astronomy. And one thing you notice is that these ones look kind of different. In fact, they're much bigger. And this is already interesting to, to astronomers, and this is exactly the reason why we want to go do gravitational waves as astronomers, is because, aha, I can look at a new population of sources. And, and I can learn something new about the universe. And this is what we, why we want to do gravitational wave astronomy. Okay, so I'm to the last paper, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it because this is the one paper that I'm an author on. Um, and this is the thing that, 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 that we're working on. And we'd like to build a gravitational wave detector in space. And I'll explain why in the next couple of slides. But what this paper basically shows is that uh, largely due to the efforts of the European Space Agency and the European uh, community, also some, some effort from NASA, um, we are able to uh, basically fly a mission, which is flying right now, uh, which we can sort of demonstrate the technologies we need to build a detector in space. And I'll explain a little bit about why we want to do that. So people might have seen the electromagnetic spectrum, seeing a chart that looks kind of like this, where you have uh, you know, frequency or wavelength running along the horizontal axis, and you have things going from radio waves up through you know, microwave and infrared and optical and X-ray and, you know, and gamma rays and all that kind of thing. You have the same thing in gravitational waves. There's an entire spectrum. There's not just one kind. And we can have the spectrum uh, basically by the frequency of the waves or by the period of the waves, how long it takes them to go up and down. And so what I've plotted on the bottom here are the different kinds of detectors. Well, actually, we'll start with the top. I'll plot on the top here the different kinds of sources that, produce, that we think produce waves in those different bands. So that purple band here sort of lines up with this area. That tells you that these kinds of sources will produce frequent waves with these kinds of frequencies. These kinds of sources will produce waves with these kinds of frequencies, et cetera, et cetera. So on the bottom, I have different kinds of detectors. 
So things like LIGO, which I'll call terrestrial interferometers, can see things from maybe down to hertz up to like a kilohertz. So they work in this band. If you want to go lower, you've got to go to space. And it's kind of like the same reason if you want to do infrared astronomy, you've got to get away from the Earth's atmosphere. In this case, what we have to get away from is actually the motion of the Earth itself. The Earth is sort of jiggling around so much that we can't do low frequency gravitational wave detection on Earth. The other advantage is remember that, that we have strain is this change in length over length. If I go to space, four kilometers is sort of expensive for building vacuum tubes. And you know, eventually you have to deal with things like the curvature of the Earth if you want to make it much longer. In space, I can make it big. In fact, I like to make this like a million kilometers. Right? So let me talk a little bit about, about the LISA concept. Now, I'm drawing it here is this sort of this cartoon. This is not my drawing, but this sort of cartoon drawing. Um, this thing has actually been originally, I, the, the original sort of napkin sketch like this was also in the 70s. And people have been working on this since, since the 80s. It's just a little bit, little bit farther behind. And there was a NASA ESA project where we fleshed this out in, in, in quite, quite great detail. But the basic idea is we want to build this triangle. The triangle is kind of like having two detectors with, one, with sort of sharing one, one arm. So I think of it as sort of two V-shaped detectors that are kind of overlapped or kind of half overlapped. So that helps us get that, um, that triangulation and the, and the um, uh, rejecting of, of instrument noise. We make the arms big. So maybe 5 million kilometers, maybe 1 million kilometers, something, something in that range. So 5 million kilometers is 14 times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So this is a big telescope. Um, the arms are actually basically laser beams, which we're using to measure between the two satellites, measure that distance. And inside the satellite, there's a little cube um, that's actually freely floating inside the satellite. And that's the part we were, we were testing on, on, um, on Pathfinder. That represents those little points in, in general relativity. So what can we do with LISA? So there's a bunch of different science areas. I'm going to go over them in pretty high detail. But one is you could do the same thing LIGO does, where they look at black hole mergers, but you scale up the mass. So instead of looking at 10 solar mass black holes, you're looking at million solar mass black holes, like the ones we have at the centers of galaxies. And these things are so loud, there's such a, such a large event, you can see them to the edge of the observable universe. So basically, if there's any of these things happening anywhere in the universe, we can see them. Um, and the estimates are something like 10 per, or, or 100 per year for an instrument like LISA. And you'd learn about uh, sort of both how the black holes form and also about how galaxies form, because we think galaxies form by basically merging together. And when they have black holes in the center, those black holes will merge. And we can trace how those black holes merge and learn how the galaxies merge. So that's what we'd like to do with that. Um, there's also a really cool event. So we know there's big, massive black holes at the centers of galaxies. And occasionally, little uh, black holes will fall into them. Now, um, oftentimes, we see stars falling into these things. And it produces an X-ray event we call a tidal disruption. And this is a very interesting event. But that's because the star, as it, get as it gets close to the black hole's gravity, gets shredded apart. And that's actually uh, interesting for an astronomer, but it's sort of bad if you're trying to understand general relativity, because what you'd like to do is drop a particle into a black hole and watch how it orbits and trace out the orbit and see, is it really the black hole that Einstein had predicted? And with a black hole, if you drop, use that as your test particle, it can't get torn apart. It's pure gravity, right? And so this thing can orbit around, and they do these crazy orbits, um, and then eventually plunge into the black hole. And you can match those orbits against the predictions of general relativity and probably make the most extreme test of general relativity that's conceivable. So if you really want to understand if gravity is going to break, it's going to break here, right? So this is where you want to, want to understand gravity. Um, you can also do some more sort of uh, traditional astronomy, if you will where we can get a census of actually millions of these binaries in the um, what we call close binaries, which are things we know from x-ray studies. Actually, many of those black holes that were in that, um, in that chart before are these kinds of stars that are in our own Milky Way. But they're all emitting gravitational waves. And this actually kind of makes this cacophony of millions of sources that are all on top of one another. And it's a big data analysis challenge to try to pick the individual ones out. But we think we could pick out maybe tens of thousands and actually do things like you know, tell you, well, how many black hole black hole binaries are there in the, in the Milky Way versus neutron star black hole binaries versus white dwarf white dwarf binaries, you know, these kind of things that astronomers are interested in. And we could maybe even do things like try to map the Milky Way in white dwarf binaries. You know, how, what's, how does that distribution in the galaxies differ from the stars? So this is really, you know, and another really interesting thing is that there's 14 of these objects that are known right now. So that is their physical, really known objects. Um, which we could point to on the sky, and you can calculate, uh, you know, how big is the gravitational waves, and could Lisa see them? And in fact, Lisa could see them um, quite easily. So they're sources that are like guaranteed. You turn them on, and they're just there because they're on all the time. These these stars, and then of course there's the unexpected sources. So maybe really exotic physics, uh, maybe some exotic astrophysics, or or who knows what. Um, so so that's why we'd like to do this. <clears throat> 
So why are we doing this thing called Lisa Pathfinder? And I like to call it, for this thing I call picophobia, right? So this is basically the, and I made up this definition, you won't find this, but this is the extreme or irrational fear of large negative exponents, especially when related to engineering requirements. So <laughs> at, at a place like, like LIGO, I mean, yes, many engineers were involved, but it was really driven by experimental physicists. When you go to do something in space flight, you really don't want people like me, you know, the physicists in there, um, you know, building the spacecraft. You want the engineers doing it because they're going to do it right and it's not going to blow up on the launch pad or not going to break, you know, you know ha halfway up there. So you need to be able to communicate these requirements. And a lot of times, you know, we go and we say, well, we need to keep this thing stable to a picometer. And they go, what's a picometer? So, so really there was sort of this... Um, this, expect, this thought that, that doing something like LISA was just too hard. So instead of doing LISA, we did this. We cut out one arm, we put it in a single spacecraft, and we shrunk it down so it fit in a single spacecraft, and we got this thing called LISA Pathfinder. So LISA Pathfinder is two test masses with a laser interferometer between them, and it's like this big. Right, so two test masses, laser interferometer. So when you do this, you actually uh, get rid of all of your gravitational wave signal, and you keep all of your noise. So if you're an astronomer, that's a bad deal, right? You keep all the noise, lose all the signal. If you're an instrument scientist, that's actually a pretty good deal because you want to understand the noise, right? And so, so for the instrument scientists, this really lets us understand, well, how well can we put this test mass in free fall? How well can we measure the distances between these things? And is it good enough so that if we scaled it up to the full detector, we could make a gravitational wave detection? So here's this idea of drag-free of drag control. So when we get up in space, we have this little cube. Actually, I have some... Uh, um, little plastic models I can pull out uh, during the question and answer prop, uh, period. So you have this cube and we let it go inside the spacecraft. So it's actually in a little cavity in the spacecraft and it's freely falling. So it's not touching the spacecraft at all. So imagine that something comes and pushes on the spacecraft, like let's say the solar wind is a big one. Well now the spacecraft is no longer in free fall and it'll start to move towards the test mass and eventually crash into it. But we have a sensor system that senses that and we have a thruster system that can counteracts that and we fly in balance around that test mass. And so I like to think of it as a flying shield that sort of flies around the test mass and shields it from kind of any, any external disturbances. Um, so that's the idea of drag-free control. So what does things look like? So here are our challenges, so here are our test masses. Uh, we need to isolate them from for forces and we, we express our requirement in acceleration. And so one G, 10 meters per second squared is acceleration on, on Earth. We want to do femto G, 10 to the minus 15 of that. Um, we need to have thrusters that can push this several hundred kilogram spacecraft around. They, they thrust with um, precisions that sort of sub micronewton. So their total thrust is, is in a micronewton range. That's about the weight of a mosquito in 1G. And their fluctuation is, is tenths of a micronewton or hundreds of a micronewton. That's the weight of the mosquito's antennae. Right? So that's the kind of fluctuation. An inkjet printer has a thrust of about 100 micronewtons. Right? So these are tiny, tiny little thrusters. But they have to be very precise. Uh, we have to do this precision optical metrology. So here we see. Um, during one of the integration, this is that, that interferometer picture from uh, back here, that one. So that's what it really looks like. And then, of course, the spacecraft itself, this is really where that picophobia comes in. You have to keep track of it thermally and, and um, magnetically and all these kinds of things. And one really interesting thing is you have to keep track of it gravitationally. That means we need to know the mass of every single part that we put around because the, own, the gravity of the spacecraft itself actually pulls those test masses around. And we have to keep those balanced, otherwise they were going to fall into the walls. And for instance, see these little blue things? These are little zip ties, little, little cable ties that are holding cables that are going to the photoreceivers. Well, we care about the mass of those things. Not because they're going to keep the spacecraft from, from you know, being able to launch. We care about the mass because they're going to pull the test mass around from their own gravity. So what they had to do was they would weigh the, each zip tie, put it on there, zip it, clip the end off, weigh the clip, write down the difference and say, that's how much mass I left in there, and then add that to their gravity model. And, and I mean, it's just incredible. That's the kind of, kind of engineering that we had to do. So here's some pretty pictures um, of, of, here's integration. So this is, shows you the scale of this thing. It's actually pretty small. Um, here's the whole payload going into the spacecraft. So this is a whole spacecraft here. Here's one of the thrusters, which is provided by NASA. Um, and then here's the rocket in uh, French Guiana, um, uh, getting ready to, ready to be launched uh, last December. And there is a launch on December 3rd. Uh, UTC December 2nd uh, in, in East Coast time. So we, well, I didn't get to go down, but I got to watch it online. Um, and let's see, what do we do in, in Lisa Pathfinder? So basically what we do is we've been running a European payloads, which actually several of us in the U.S. are also working on. I ran from March to June. Uh, the NASA payload's running right now, and there's a uh, mission extension that just got approved. It'll run through from October through to next May.
And what we basically do is we, we do two modes of operation. In one mode of operation, we sort of sit there and measure the noise. So we want to see how well do we place these test masses in free fall, right? And on another mode, we do experiments where we try to understand, well, what's causing the noise? So we maybe deliberately make something worse. So like we change the temperature and we see, does that make the test mass move? And we sort of make these deliberate couplings to understand all the noise. And eventually we want to build this thing we call a noise budget, where you have all the different contributions. And this is just, you know, four of them, but there's like 50 of them. And we do experiments to understand all these different things so, we, so that we basically have a, a, a model that we've then checked against a, against a flight you know, mission, you know, against, against a real piece of hardware. And now we have a lot of confidence that if we go to build LISA and we say, well, what if we make the temperature like this instead of like that? Or we make the magnetic field like this instead of like that? We understand that this, we can use that model that's been checked against, against reality to build the next instrument and have a lot of confidence. Um, and this is just sort of cute. This is, this is the way it really works, right? So you have all this grand science, and you end up with one guy typing on a laptop and 10 people standing around them with coffee going, is that the right thing? You know, what's going on here? Can you make this? Cur-? And this is, this is in the operations room in, in Germany, and this is where we spent a lot of our, a lot of our time uh, recently. So what's the, fi- what's the big result? So this is a big result that came out of that paper. It's a little technical, but since, since it is our result, I wanted to, uh, wanted to try to go through it. So basically, this is a, a plot where on the vertical axis here, you have the acceleration, and it's in these funny units of meters per second squared per root hertz, so forget about the, forget about the units, but meters per second squared is acceleration. Um, and it's basically saying how much acceleration do you have from ideal perfect free fall? And these numbers are in a log, logarithmic scale. So this is 10 to the minus 12, so a trillionth. This is a tenth of a trillionth. This is a hundredth of a trillionth. And this is uh, whatever the thousandth of a trillionth is, a quadrillionth. Um, so, so that's that's the size of these of these numbers, and then over here is basically frequency. So this is saying if I have fluctuations in the acceleration, how fast are those fluctuations? So the main point of this is that you want things to be low. So the lower they are on this, the better, and the the and going from here to here is a factor of ten better, right? And from here to here is another factor of ten better. That's a, that's a logarithmic scale. So this orange line here is where we said we wanted to go for Lisa Pathfinder. It was a tech demo. We weren't going to try to get to the full, full mission performance. Um, the green line here is where we would need to go for Lisa. And this uh, purple line here is where we got. And this white line is basically expl- ex- explaining our noise model. And this is a couple months old. We're actually actually a little bit better now, uh, actually below the Lisa requirement. So this is just incredible because it says not only do we meet our requirements and exceed it by quite a bit, but we basically are ready to do LISA, and that's, that's the main message out of that paper. So if we look ahead, um, there's a lot of really interesting things going on. So uh, on LIGO, there's some further upgrades. So, so basically, to get to their final advanced LIGO configuration, they wanted to sort of make some upgrades, do some science, make some upgrades, do some science. And so since their end of January, when they stopped their, um, their data taking, they've been doing major upgrades. And they're actually about to come on again in a period of weeks to months. So something in like late September, early October, they'll turn on again for another six month run with a little bit better sensitivity. And you would expect that they should get at least another handful of these black hole events, maybe, maybe even more. Um, so that's really exciting. Also really exciting on the ground is, is this worldwide network that's being developed. So the Italians have a three kilometer detector. It's a collaboration with the French and, and the Germans and some other, other groups as well. Um, and they're very close to turning on. They're hoping to be able to turn on in this advanced configuration and join LIGO during their second observing run. Having three detectors really helps you do the localization and figure out where on the sky the signal's coming from. Uh, interestingly, there have been efforts for a long time to try to get a, 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 um, a detector going in India. They kind of stalled in the Indian parliament. The day after the detection, the Indian prime minister tweeted that he's going to do LIGO, LIGO in India. It's called, you know, and, and it happened, right? So, I mean, just you get the detection and bang, they were on it. And, you know, the prime minister tweets it and all of a sudden it gets right through uh, parliament. So, I mean, it was pretty amazing to see that going. The Japanese are building a detector inside a mountain. They're going to make it cryogenic. Um, you know, they're sort of trying to push the next level of, of technology. They're working very hard. Um, and then on, the, on, the, on space for this laser interferometer or LISA con- concept, we continue to get these results from Pathfinder for the next year, and we'll be analyzing them. Uh, the European Space Agency and NASA are working right now to sort of figure out how to partner on a, on a, on a LISA-scale mission with launch maybe in the late 2020s, maybe, maybe early 2030s. And so this is really starting to heat up, um, again, largely due to the, the interest generated from LIGO. There was just a report that came out from the National Research Council last week that said the U.S. really ought to do this. Um, and so that's very encouraging. And then two things I didn't mention, if you notice when I did the, um, 
with a spectrum plot, there was two other kinds of detectors that were farther down there. So at frequencies below what we would do with LISA, there's a thing called pulsar timing arrays. And these are kind of cool. They use those radio pulsars as like a galactic scale gravitational wave antenna. Um, and so they're coming along quite nicely. And then there's something called cosmic microwave background polarization, uh, which actually made a bunch of news a couple of years ago where they thought they detected this polarization signal, which comes from gravitational waves produced in the Big Bang. It uh, turns out that was probably due to dust. But the general principle is still completely uh, valid, and it's, it's very likely that, that eventually, you know, whether it's a period of years or maybe 10 years, uh, these signals will start to get detected as well. So it's a very bright future for, for gravitational waves. And so my, my last chart and summary here is basically that, you know, if we kind of look at gravitational waves over the last 100 years, they've moved from being a mathematical curiosity to sort of a, an astrophysical reality where we, where we knew that they would be in principle there. We could sort of see them indirectly. And now they're a new tool for doing astronomy, right? We can measure gravitational waves with LIGO. We can understand new kinds of black holes. We'll soon be able to measure them with things like LISA and pulsar timing and do a totally new kinds of astronomy. So in the next 100 years, we're going to extend our gravitational wave ears or eyes from just this one little slice of the frequency spectrum we can do on the ground to an entire array of, the fre of, of, of gravitational waves. And we'll have all kinds of new insights for physics and astronomy. And I think I'll end the talk there and take questions. <coughs> incredible and I'm glad you're young because maybe you'll be able to see some of these great <laughs> advances in the future. Um, we could either have questions and answers or we could have a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll do the questions and answers and if you would repeat the question so everybody and we can also get a for our, um, our webcast. Am I but picking the? You get to okay. pick, yes. You, sir. Uh, how do you determine where the event occurred? Yeah, so it's basically uh, uh, localizations from, from time of flight. So, so, with, the, so with the LIGO detectors, um, you have two very separate detectors. Oh, the question is how do you determine the, the, the location? I forgot to do that part. So you have the two detectors, and the wave basically hits one detector first, and then it hits the other detector. And by knowing the time, the time difference, you can basically draw an arc on the sky of where it could have, could have come from. Now, an arc is not that good for localization. Now you can do a little bit better uh, because with a little bit of subtleties of sort of um, how loud the event was and everything, and you can actually constrain that arc into a little strip on the sky. But what you can do with two detectors is still quite quite difficult for, say, someone trying to, to follow up with an op with a uh, optical telescope. It's just too big of an area of sky. That's why the detector in Italy and the detector in India is, are really important because when you get that thir with those third detectors and the fourth detectors, you get to draw different arcs in different directions, and then they only converge in small parts in the sky, and you get a little patch on the sky. For LISA, uh, because our sources are long-lived, um, the, the satellites actually move in their orbit. They're in an orbit around the sun. And so they move in their orbit pretty significantly during the event. So the event lasts for months or years, as opposed to last, lasting for a small fraction of a second. And there we can use the fact that both you get a modulation in the amplitude and the strength of the wave from the, from the motion, and you get a Doppler shift, uh, basically not modulation of the frequency the, as, as the satellites are moving around. You can use that to localize. And just behind you. What can you say is the wavelength of the gravitational yeah, you tell me the frequency, I can tell you the wavelength. Yeah. And so basically, it's the, same, it's the same formula you use for light. They propagate at the speed of light, and so it's, it's just the ratio of the frequency and the wavelength gets you the speed. So, um, so for, for some, and that's one of the reasons. So for millihertz size um, gravitational waves, which is what we'd like to go after for something like LISA, the wavelengths are scales of millions of kilometers, which is why we want to build our detector to be a million kilometers. So you, in general, there's a general principle for building antennas. You want to build your antenna to be roughly the size of the wavelength of the radiation you're trying to measure. And that's same with, with your building electromagnetic antennas or if you're building gravitational wave antennas. So half wave. Half wave or quarter wave or what, yeah, right. I said roughly. I'm being a physicist here, right? Same order of magnitude. There's one in the back. There, there. Uh, you just said that the uh, events last days or months. How are you going to distinguish between two events colliding? Yeah, right. So, so again, so this is a problem for LISA, not for LIGO. So for LIGO, everything is smaller masses, and so it happens more quickly. And we have to remember when we say smaller masses, we're still talking about, you know, tens of times the mass of our sun, and they were revolving around each other faster than your kitchen blender goes around, right? So that's just like, right? Um, but for LISA, we're talking about millions of solar mass, and they're going around each other every hour. So it's much slower, right? But, but still, that whole event lasts for, for sort of months where we, where we can detect it. And yeah, you're right. We could have multiple events. 
And so you basically do it the same way your your radio station, radio receiver in your car can can pick out different stations. You know, you have to know something about the um, about what the signal is that's being produced, right? So when I turn on the radio, I know that okay, the radio station I want to listen to is at this particular frequency, and it has this particular encoding of the information. That's what the numerical relativity gets you. It says I have this template for for a waveform. And basically, if I have multiple signals, I need multiple templates, and I try to do a fit of all the templates at the same time to try to pull out pull out the signals. So that's a data analysis challenge for sure, but it's definitely a, it's it's a it's a tractable one, and that's actually something that we've done a lot of work on. And we have these things called mock data challenges, where basically we get together, we we agree on the types of signals that could be in in a you know in a data stream, and we we have one group of people produce a data stream with some signals in it, and the other people try to go find those signals. And we see, can they find all of them? Do they find the right ones? You know, that it's, and you don't tell them how many are in there, right? And they have you know, a few months to go find them, and then they, 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 they use their algorithms on them, they find them, and, then, and, and that seems to generally work. So that's how we do it. Right, question back here. You've talked about polarized gravity waves. Yep. Are you just talking about linearly polarized or circularly polarized when you've got a right-handed or right. So, well, okay. So, so then, so the question is about polarization of gravitational waves. So, the polarization is a little bit different than the polarization that you get for light, okay. and that's um, it's the same math, but it basically has to do with the fact that there's only a single charge for gravitation. So, there's only a positive mass. There's not positive mass and negative mass. And so, as a result, we have these quadrupolar fields as opposed to dipole fields, and the polarizations are in a different. So, there are polarization states. Mathematically, there's six of them. And only two of them are predicted to exist from general relativity. And those are the two that I showed. So there's the, the, the plus polarization, which is basically doing this stretching along this direction, like this. And then there's a cross, which is sort of 45. I'm trying to do my gravitational wave dance. So those are the, um, th those are the two polarizations. Not like electromagnetic. It's, it's very similar, but rather than the polarization, for instance, the polarizations aren't rotated by 90 degrees. They're rotated by 45 degrees. And it's because of the symmetry of the field. Um, so yeah, the, the, the math is the same, but it's in, the intuition is a little bit different. The question in the back. In your next 100 years phase. Not my next 100 years. Yeah. <laughs> not that young. Your scenario, yeah. What are the um, potential discoveries you think you can find through gravitational wave detection? Well, right, so there's a Yogi Berra quote about hard to predict new things, especially the future or whatever. Um, but, but, you know, I think, I think, first of all, you can look to what LIGO's done now and see already we saw a class of of black holes that we didn't really expect. These things at the 30 solar mass, 60 solar mass. We didn't really think, you know, it really makes it difficult for the astronomers to try to figure out, you know, where those things came from. So that's one example is you could have um, other kinds of astrophysical, uh, you know, surprises, right? So maybe there are 1,000 solar mass black holes. We don't know, right? So we think now that there's basically two different kinds. There's sort of the tens of solar mass black holes that come from dying stars, and there's a million solar mass black holes that come from we don't know where, but we know that they're there, right? The, there's always thought that there's been a mass gap, but maybe there's not, and gravitational waves would be a good way to look at it. So that's an example of sort of exotic astrophysics. There could also be exotic physics. So um, if you come up with these exotic theories like, like cosmic strings, you know, almost all of them couple to gravity in some way. And so there's ideas of like if you have cosmic strings that have little kinks in them and those kinks uh, relax, they'll produce a little burst of gravitational waves. We could go look for those. Um, I wouldn't try to, you know, build a whole detector to do that. Well. I would, but I wouldn't be able to get the money to do it uh, because it's kind of speculative. But you know, it's it's hard hard to to predict what you're gonna what you're gonna see. So I think broadly speaking, it's you know, you know, astrophysics surprises and physics surprises, and we got a good chance of getting after both of those. And there's one in, up here. If if you happen to be looking at one of these uh, colliding black holes that you're seeing gravitationally with an optical telescope or a radio telescope. Would you have seen anything? Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent question. So the question is, could you see anything with electromagnetic uh, telescope? So um, the answer is, in principle, in principle, yes. Okay, so it really has to do with the sources, and it's actually something that we'd really like to go after, and we call it multi-messenger astronomy. So there's this big idea of multi-wavelength astronomy, where I look at the same kind of object with radio waves and optical and UV and all kinds of things, and I put the so sort of full, pic full color picture together to understand the object. Here's the idea is if we could look at gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves at the same time, I've got completely different and kind of complementary channels of information that I can use to, to, to understand the system. Now, for the system that LIGO saw, it's two black holes. And black holes are pure gravity, and they basically don't emit electromagnetic radiation, right? So you wouldn't expect that any kind of telescope could see one. Now, that said, black holes in nature are often surrounded by some kind of gas or something, and they might make uh, some sort of 
something, right? Some little burst, right? And there were actually are people that were working to, to try to follow up these, these these events, and there was a sort of tentative maybe correlation with a with some gamma rays that were detected by the Fermi mission. Um, I think it's probably unlikely that that was actually correlated, but it was very 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 interesting um, interesting paper. Now, when LIGO starts detecting things like neutron stars, so there's a little bit less massive, they're going to need a little bit more sensitivity to have a good chance of detecting those things, but that's one of the things they're really going after. Neutron stars are made out of matter. They're, 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 they're very similar to black holes, but they're made out of matter. Um, and when they crash into one another, we have a very high confidence that they produce, if they're pointed at us, they produce gamma ray bursts, which we can see to the way farther than we could detect the, the gravitational waves from, from LIGO. Or if we're seeing them from some other angle, they might produce a sort of small supernova, a thing called a kilonova, and people are trying to go after that too. So once LIGO starts seeing um, gra gravitational waves from neutron stars, there'd be a lot of opportunities for that. And with LISA, there's also lots of opportunities, but that's a long answer. But that's exactly what we'd like to do is we'd like to do multi-messenger multi astronomy. Uh, maybe there's one here in the front. Uh, yeah, this is a, a kind of a practical question. As a physicist, I definitely think we should be supporting this kind of research. And I know that some of the news releases said that the European Space Agency launched the LISA Pathfinder. What uh, percent or amount is the U.S. contributing to this research? Ooh, the political question. Yeah. Any, anybody from NASA headquarters here? Uh, yeah. Well, okay. So, so the LISA project. Um, you know, so there's interest both in the U.S. and in Europe to doing to doing this thing. And back in 2000, the two agencies got together and started a project. And they started a project to build a full thing. And now, as part of that, they said we want to go do a technology demonstrator. And both the technology demonstrator and the full mission were roughly 50-50 partnerships. Now, the technology demonstrator sort of started to drag on a little bit. Uh, there were some funding problems on the NASA side, some technical problems on, on, on both sides. And basically, the Europeans doubled down on their funding and spent like 10 times more money than they were expecting to. And NASA kind of cut it off and said, we're only going to do so much. So for Pathfinder, uh, it was almost like an 80-20 kind of expenditure um, in, in terms of 20 percent NASA and 80 percent uh, uh, European. Um, now, then, at the same time, we were still holding together this idea we're going to do a, an equal partnership um, with, with the Europeans on LISA. And, but back in 2011, uh, NASA kind of had to, we basically had to pull out because we didn't have the, have the budget. And so then the Europeans said, well, we're going to try to make the detector a little less capable and see if we can do it on our own. They've been pushing that idea for the last several years. Um, and, and now they're starting to make it look a little bit, little bit more, more real. Um, they've, they've gotten a selection, but with a nominal launch date in 2034, which is kind of long for a lot of us. And, and now with all the interest in gravitational waves, um, there's renewed interest in the U.S. The Europeans certainly could use some financial help. Um, I think we could also provide some technical help. And we're trying to work with the Europeans to figure out what kind of share the U.S. can, can, um, can uh, can, can play. And actually, this report I just mentioned in, in the National Academies that just came out uh, last week was a review of the decadal survey. So the decadal surveys are things that set policies for, for space science. And one of their main recommendations was the U.S. should get back into uh, to LISA at, at the major, you know, at the sort of, you know, a, a significant role. Um, so that's all playing out now in the politics. But I think it's pretty likely that, that we'll have a significant role. Uh, one follow-up. I ask that question because it almost looks to me like we're repeating the history of what happened with CERN. I moved up here from <laughs> Texas, yep. and we had a big project down there yep. that got canceled, and now we have nothing in the area of super colliders, and there is one. Yeah, people are aware of that for yeah. sure. <laughs> I think I think that that analogy is not lost on people, and uh, I think you know. Okay. Both the headquarters folks and the scientists are working hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Write to your congressman, and there'll be a collection at the door for NASA. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> they probably want us out of here, but do you want to do one I'm more? Happy and then to, I'll stay as, until they kick me people out. People can come up okay. here afterwards. Wait, wait, wait. I have thousands of questions. Thousands, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about just one? Very fun one. 1919, Eddington does the experiment, finds it. I'm trying to understand. Why did the general public react to this information in the way that the result is that Albert becomes this iconic figure of the 20th century? So the, so the question is, why, why did the public react to the prediction of the, I mean, I, I, the verification of Einstein's uh, prediction? I mean, I think because it was just, it, it was such a, um, 
uh, a wacky prediction and to have it actually come true um, was, just, was just sort of amazing. I mean, people have this, uh, I think, largely due to the, this Einstein, they have this idea that that's how science works, that sort of uh, people sit and they say, well, I'm going to make, make a theory and I'm going to predict what's going to happen, and then somebody goes out and measures it. That almost never happens. It, it usually is the complete opposite way. We go and we measure something and go, what the heck was that? And then the theories, theorists have to figure out you know, what, you know, what it meant. And it's only those rare cases where people make a prediction that's, that's very outlandish, and then it takes a long time and a significant effort to go, to go verify it that, 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 that people really become you know, lauded and, and famous. And Einstein's the, the key example of that. And the question here is that we're discussing special and general relativity. I would have figured the population in 1919 was maybe, at best, 10,000 people on the Earth understood what those papers were about. Uh, I Again, think that's probably on the Earth now. It's still smaller than that. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So why would the general public react to something they had absolutely no idea what they were talking I about? I guess you'd have to ask a sociologist. And, that's yeah. what I keep doing. Okay. That's why I'm here. <laughs> well, I'm a physicist. So, I, I, so, But you're here and I get yeah. to talk to you. Yeah. Second question. Do you accept the existence of yeah, entanglement? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, that. Do you accept the existence of entanglement? Quantum entanglement. Uh, yes, but it has nothing to do with this. Well, I understand, yeah. but I'm okay. just saying, you know, this is your cup of tea, you know. Thank yeah. you all. <laughs> all right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.